After watching this video, you should be able to describe the regulation of erythropoiesis using a feedback control diagram and predict the effects of disturbances in any of the elements of the feedback system. Now let's start with the definition of erythropoiesis, which is the production of red blood cells. Now we can see here that we have erythropoiesis occurring in the bone marrow, and the principal hormone regulating erythropoiesis is called erythropoietin. Now erythropoietin, if the levels go up in the blood, then erythropoiesis increases. And if erythropoietin levels fall, then erythropoiesis falls. So this is a positive relationship between erythropoietin and erythropoiesis. Now the erythropoietin has receptors called erythropoietin receptor that stimulates cell division, differentiation, prevention of erythroid progenitor apoptosis. And there's a bunch of different things, but the net effect is erythropoietin stimulates erythropoiesis. Now, during the process of erythropoiesis, which is a tightly regulated process, stem cells differentiate into erythroid progenitors and then finally mature into red blood cells. Now, when one of the progeny of the multipotential hematopoietic stem cells become committed to the erythroid lineage, this early erythroid progenitor undergoes a series of changes and eventually becomes the mature recognizable red blood cell. Now I'm going to focus on are just a couple of changes. Right before the red blood cells come out of the marrow, they extrude their nucleus and come out as freshly minted reticulocytes. And reticulocytes are, you can think of as baby, young red blood cells. Now this is going to be a positive relationship because if erythropoiesis is stimulated, you're going to have more reticulocytes coming out of the marrow. Now, the reticulocyte's interesting because it contains, retains still some mitochondria, small number of ribosomes, a centriole, some remnants of the Golgi. It still has some of these organelles that it has to get rid of before becoming the fully mature red blood cell. Now this takes normally about 24 hours. So the reticulocytes, there's going to be a direct relationship of them to the red blood cell mass and I just want to just indicate here that this takes about uh, a day or so for them to become fully mature, okay? And the red blood cell mass can be measured by either looking at uh, hemoglobin, abbreviated HB, or hematocrit um, HCT, okay? Now, the red blood cell mass Obviously, renal red blood cells carry hemoglobin, hemoglobin binds oxygen, and so there's going to be a direct relationship between the red blood cell mass and oxygen delivery to the tissues, including the kidneys. And so this is going to be a plus, but I, I want to just point out that the arterial partial pressure of oxygen also must play an important role in loading oxygen onto hemoglobin, saturating it. So the lung function, which is going to be um, uh, regulating the arterial O2, plays an important role uh, as well as the red blood cell mass. Now this oxygen delivery to the kidneys also is going to be dependent on cardiac output, of course. It's going to be delivering the blood flow to the kidneys, and after all, the kidneys do get a, a very high blood percentage of blood flow um, from the heart. And the kidneys are special because they have the capability to produce erythropoietin. Now the way this works is that there's what's called hypoxia-inducible factors, transcription factors, that regulate gene expression of erythropoietin. And the idea is that if, as oxygen levels go up, erythropoietin secretion and synthesis decreases. And so this is going to be a negative relationship. And it's kind of interesting because what happens is that when there's oxygen, um, increased oxygen delivery to the kidneys, these, um, these hypoxia-inducible factors and other transcription factors get uh, ubiquitated and degraded and don't go to the nucleus. So it's only when, when you have hypoxic uh, conditions uh, in the kidney that these transcription factors go into the nucleus and go on to the erythropoietin gene and increase gene transcription and ultimately secretion of erythropoietin into the blood.
So you can see here that we have a negative feedback loop because we have an odd number of inversions. And you can see that if we have an, a concept of how this all works, we can predict very important clinical examples that there's perturbations in the system. So let's take a look at what some of those might be. Now, what we have here is erythropoietin levels in the blood, reticulocyte percentages, a reticulocyte count, and red blood cell mass. So those are three important uh, things that we can look at. And if we start with one example, which is decreased red blood cell survival. Now let's go back to our diagram and take a look at where, where we might start with this disturbance. So if there was a decrease in red blood cell survival, the problem would start at the red blood cell mass because what you'd have instead of typically uh, a red blood cell lifespan of 100 days or so or 120 days, that would be markedly reduced. Um, th th this is going to be occurring in things like hemolytic anemia where there's increased red blood cell destruction. And so if we go back to our uh, table here, we'd want to start with the red blood cell mass uh, decreasing. Okay. And so that would go down like this. Okay. And if we go back to our feedback system, you can see that if the red blood cell mass goes down, then what happens is that um, we're going to have decreased oxygen delivery of the kidney, and then we're going to have increased erythropoietin. So the way that would work is erythropoietin would go up, okay, and because erythropoietin would be stimulating the marrow, increased red blood cell production, we'd have an increase in the reticulocytes as well. And that would be the appropriate response to a decreased red blood cell mass and would help try to stabilize the red blood cells. All right. Now, if we look at these next three, we have iron deficiency, B12 deficiency, and folate deficiency. All right. The way that would work, if we were going to think about how that would look over here, is that in order for the red blood cells to fully mature and develop properly, we need special uh, nutrients and vitamins. And um, iron, for example, um, vitamin B12, and folate. These all would be important in the process of normal effective uh, erythropoiesis. So if we had a problem with any of these, what we'd, what we'd start would be a decrease in the reticulocytes. Okay, so what we would what we would be looking at is you know all of these would go down. So these would all really be the same. Okay, and of course the red blood cell mass, you know, decreased hemoglobin or hematocrit, those would all, all go down. And the appropriate response would be an increase in erythropoietin. And um, in other words, erythropoietin would be increased in attempts to um, increase the red blood cell mass, but because there's a problem in the marrow um, in the first place that those all should be down. Okay. Now another example is what if we had kidney disease? Now, remember we said the kidney is an important uh, site of erythropoietin secretion and so we'd start with erythropoietin going down and if erythropoietin is down we'd have a decreased reticulocyte and then, of course, we'd have decreased red blood cell mass. Now, I hope you can appreciate that in all of these examples here, all right, this would all be examples of what's called anemia. Okay? And a very important way to differentiate uh, major types of anemia is to look at the reticulocytes. And you can see here that with the exception of a decreased red blood cell survival where there's a reticulocytosis, we can see in all these other examples where there's a problem either um, with the red blood cell, the hyperproliferative type of anemia or an ineffective hematopoiesis, you don't have the proper ingredients, uh, reticulocytes are down or you have a reticulocytopenia. And that's a very important way to kind of get a, a, a good uh, idea about what category you're looking at. Okay, looking at the reticulocyte uh, count.
Um, and, and you can see here that uh, in most cases, the erythropoietin level should be elevated in, in normal response to the anemia, the decreased oxygen delivery of the kidney. Obviously, if you have kidney disease, the problem is you, you're not making erythropoietin. Now, there's a couple more examples at the bottom, and uh, first one um, is lung disease. Now, lung disease is going to impact the alveolar partial pressure of oxygen, ultimately the arterial partial pressure of oxygen, and that's going to ultimately affect the oxygen delivery to the kidney, okay, and that's going to increase erythropoietin, all right, and if erythropoietin goes up, you're going to have an increase in retics, reticulocytes, and you're going to have an increase in red blood cell mass, all right. And, and you'd also expect something very similar if someone went to high altitude, for example, that would also cause a low arterial PO2 and a similar type of response. And um, because this is an appropriate response, um, this sometimes is called um, secondary polycythemia. So this would be an example of uh, what's called polycythemia which is an increase in uh, red blood cell mass. In this case, it's secondary to, um, in this case, lung disease. Now, the final example here would be, what if someone had a constitutively active erythropoietin receptor? Now, the erythropoietin receptor uses what's called the JAK STAT pathway, particularly JAK2, Janus kinase. And there are people that have mutations that um, allow this, this uh, receptor to be constitutively on. And if that, in, that, in that case, if we go and look at what this would look like, we go back over here, we can see that the erythropoietin receptors are on the marrow, on the red blood cell, on the red blood cell progenitors. And if that receptor is constitutively on, then what we would start with would be with the reticulocytes and Reticulocytes would be up. Okay. And we have an increase in retics. And then, of course, the red blood cells would go up. And what would happen to erythropoietin? Erythropoietin actually would go down. It'd be suppressed because you'd have an increased oxygen delivery to the kidney. You'd have those hypoxic, uh, hypoxia inducible factor transcription factors would be, um, would be degraded um, and uh, the erythropoietin levels would fall appropriately. And this would be an example of a primary polycythemia. Okay, and so this would extend, these two examples would be examples of polycythemia. This first one, the lung disease, was an example of a secondary polycythemia, and this one here would be an example of a primary polycythemia. So I think that now that we've gone through this exercise, you can describe the regulation of erythropoiesis using a simple feedback control system and then predict very important clinical examples on how that would affect um, lab values, the reticulocytes and the red blood cells, and even if you were going to measure erythropoietin levels in the blood. So that concludes this lecture on regulation of erythropoiesis using feedback control.